Hello, this is Dr. Ross, and this is the video lecture, Bones of the Body Axis. This is for anatomy and physiology uh, for my class, as well as Dr. Camp's class. So the learning outcomes for this video lecture include the skeletal system and articulations, specifically organization of the skeletal system. We're going to distinguish between axial and appendicular skeletons. So this lecture is going to be talking about the axial skeleton, and I'm going to be listing and discussing major bones contained within it. The appendicular will come later. Uh, we're also going to be talking about bones of the skeleton in this lecture, so I will identify individual bones and locations, and I will also identify uh, some of the major bone markings on these bones. All right, so let's review the axial skeleton briefly. I know we've already discussed it, but I'm just going to go over a little bit about it before I um, start on the remaining portions. So the axial skeleton forms the central axis of the body. It's about 80 plus bones, and that includes the skull, the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage, uh, which we also refer to as the rib cage. In this lecture, we're going to focus on the other axial bones, which includes the hyoid bone, the spinal column, and the thoracic cage. So let's start with the hyoid bone. This is also the odd bone out. Why do we say that? Because it's kind of floating there in this image. If you were to remove all the muscles and ligaments and tendons uh, and just had the skeletal system, it would look like the hyoid bone is, is sort of floating in space. It's not directly attached to uh, the other bones um, or it's not closely attached to the other bones. Um, but it's held in place by uh, muscles or ligaments. Um, it aids in tongue movement and swallowing. It also provides attachment uh, to muscles of the fore of the mouth uh, and the tongue. Um, now, it, uh, so it's, it's anchored by muscles. And it also contains um, these horns called the um, greater and lesser, lesser cornu. These are two sections of bone. Um, that project from each side and of course uh, it should be no surprise at this point that these form points of attachment for muscles. So <clears throat> the hyoid bone is important to a number of physiological functions including breathing, swallowing, and speech. It's also thought to play a key role in keeping the upper airway open during sleep. Um, the hyoid bone is also not easily susceptible to fracture due to its location. However, um, um, whenever it is, um, when it has been fractured, it strongly indicates that strangulation has occurred, uh, specifically in an adult. In children and adolescents, the hyoid bone is a little more flexible uh, because ossification isn't complete, so um, strangulation uh, may not result in a fracture. But uh, during an autopsy, if a hyoid bone in an adult is found to be fractured, it's a really good case, uh, makes a really good case for murder. So now let's move on to the spine. Uh, the vertebrae in the human um, uh, are divided into different regions. All right, there are uh, 24 vertebrae. There is a five part uh, sacrum, which is down here in green a four-part um, coccyx. Now these are uh, also fused. We refer to this as the tailbone sometimes. There are three distinct types of vertebrae. We have seven cervical vertebrae. Cervical vertebrae carry the weight of the head. They also contain holes where vertebral arteries and veins pass through. Um, and the first two cervical uh, vertebrae C1 and C2 have uh, very specific names, the atlas and the axis, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. The uh, next section is the thoracic vertebrae. There are 12 thoracic vertebrae. These are named T1 through T12. 
and they start just after the cervical vertebrae. So if you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, from the top of the spine, uh, when you start over at one, you are in the thoracic vertebrae. So that would be T T1. Uh, and then finally, we have the lumbar uh, vertebrae. There are five lumbar vertebrae, and they are named L1 through L5. And this area um, bears most of the body's weight. So let's talk about spinal curvatures. Okay, so let's see. The spinal curve makes, in an adult at least, the spinal curve makes an S curve. Uh, this is not necessarily the case in children. Okay, so we have the cervical curvature, the thoracic curvature, the lumbar curvature, and the sacral curvature. So proper curvature of the spine gives it flexibility and creates support. It also absorbs shock. It aids in the distribution of weight and it reduces pressure between the, um, between the discs. So our, our verte verte vertebral discs are not stacked directly on top of each other. They're a little bit, um, they're slightly off center of each other. And so this reduces pressure. And this of course is due to the curvature of the, the spine. Now, one thing that's interesting is that our, our curve, the spine has to be curved this way for us to be able to walk right. Uh, walk upright, excuse me. The curve actually brings, the curves actually bring our head and torso into a vertical line above our feet. So our spines are a heritage from distant ancestors who actually walked on four limbs or carry themselves horizontally, uh, both in water and on, on land. So in that case, the spine functioned more like a flexible, uh, like a suspension bridge, where it was more supporting the body's organs, and it's much more well suited to walking on all fours. The human spine uh, and its curves has been transformed into a weight-bearing column, and this causes a lot of stress on our spine. Uh, and this is probably why we get um, we tend to get a lot of back injuries and a lot of back pains. So the cervical curvature at the top this forms as, as a result of lifting the head, and the lumbar curvature is more uh, from a result of walking. So. Um, as I mentioned, children have a slightly different um, uh, curvature. Children are born with a C curve, and as they hold up their head, they start to develop that curvature, and as they eventually start walking, they develop the other curvature as well. So, so ultimately, um, as they start walking and holding their head up, their spine is going to look more adult-like. Now, in addition to having um, our normal S curved spine. We also can have excessive or um, odd spinal curvature. Uh, and when you have this, it would be considered a type of spinal disease. So first here on the left, you have kyphosis. This is when you have an exaggeration of the thoracic region. Uh, the, the curvature in the thoracic region. Um, this is sometimes called humpback, uh, and it usually is a result of osteoporosis. If you look at the image in the middle here, you have lordosis. Uh, this is when you have an exaggerated concave curvature in the lumbar region. Um, and this is also sometimes referred to as swayback. This often happens during pregnancy, so it's common during that time, but uh, not during other times. And then scoliosis, which we're probably all most familiar with, is a lateral curvature. Um, this is the most common abnormal type of curving in the spine. Um, and it's a little more common among females than male. And it could be a result of unequal growth of the two sides of one or more of the vertebrae. Um, so they don't end up fusing properly. Uh, but there are treatments for scoliosis. Uh, there are braces uh, that people wear, and then there's also some surgical intervention that can be done. Okay, so now what I want to do is just talk about the typical vertebra. So when I say typical, um, I don't mean this is what they all look like, but a, a many of the vertebra in the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar region are going to share some of these features. Now, they're different sizes, um, and, and some of the, the features are slightly different on each one, and we'll talk about that a little bit in, later. But do keep in mind that they vary in sh uh, uh, shape and size.
but they tend to follow this similar structural pattern. So a typical vertebra consists of two parts, the vertebral body, which is shown here, and the vertebral arch. The body is the anterior portion and it supports the body weight. And so um, because of this, the bodies of the vertebra will get larger and larger as you get closer to the lumbar region where they are the largest. Remember, the lumbar portion of the spine supports most of our weight. Um, the vertebral arch forms the posterior portion of each vertebra. And arising from that, we have the transverse uh, process and the spinous process. There's also the superior articular process and the inferior articular process. Uh, the, ver uh, the, uh, the vertebral foramen provides the, the passageway for the spinal cord, and then each spinal nerve exits through an intervertebral foramen that's really only visible when the, uh, when the vertebra are stacked on top of each other, like the lateral view shows. Um, and then we have our intervertebral discs, um, and these lie between the bodies of the adjacent vertebra. Uh, and then you have the superior articular facet, um, and that articulates with the inferior articular facet of the vertebrae above it. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the non-typical vertebrae. Uh, we're going to talk about the atlas and the axis. So non-typical vertebrae have modifications or they may be lacking some of the features seen on the typical vertebrae. So the first two cervical vertebrae, C1 and C2, are non-typical. So the first cervical vertebrae, the C1 vertebrae, um, is also called the atlas. This is because uh, this is the vertebrae that supports the skull on top of the, uh, the spine. And in Greek mythology, there was a, a god called Atlas who supported the weight of the world or the heavens on his shoulders. And so, um, so that's where, where that name comes. Uh, the C1 vertebra does not have a body or spinous process, but it does have a superior articular surface and um, it faces upwards. And this is really, really curved. And this is for articulation with those occipital condyles that are on the base of the skull. So this is basically where the skull uh, kind of rests on uh, this atlas or C1 vertebra. So the second one, the C2, is the axis. Uh, and it's called this because it serves as the axis for rotation when you turn your head left or right. So the axis resembles a typical vertebrae in most respects, but it's really English easily distinguished uh, by this one feature here called the dens. Um, so this interacts with the articular facet. Um, of the atlas, and it's held in place by that limit uh, transverse ligament that you see there. All right, so let's talk about these individually and see if you can spot some of the difference. So the top row here are those typical vertebra. Um, so we have a vertebra. Uh, so we have the cervical vertebrae here. And it has a really small body. Okay, so this is just reflecting the fact that, that it carries the least amount of body weight. Um, but it does have uh, this, this Y-shaped spinous process. It also has uh, the transverse processes um, that really are kind of U-shaped and really sharply curved. And this is allowed the, uh, the, to allow for passage of cervical spinal nerves. Okay, so it serves a purpose that, that's slightly different. Um, and then there's also these openings called the transverse foramen um, as well. And so that's present on your cervical vertebra, but not on the other one. The thoracic, we have um, the thoracic vertebrae, um, they have um, a spinous process which is long and it has a pronounced downward angle that you can't really appreciate from this view. Uh, and it kind of overlaps with the vertebra that's inferior. Um, it also has several additional articulation sites, um, and each of these are called a facet, and um, this is often where the ribs will attach. And so you can see where I've just put this arrow up, um, there is a rib, um, that's a rib that's attaching at that site. The next one is the lumbar. 
Uh, these carry the greatest amount of weight, and so it's not surprising to see that the body is very is the largest. It's also the thickest as well, and it has a very blunt spinous process that projects, um, and they also has some pretty large articular processes. So the atlas down here, we just went over that, but this is just looking at it unstacked, so I think that gives a little bit of a different view. Um, it doesn't have a body or a spinous process that I've already mentioned. Um, the superior articular surface um, is there, and that's again where it articulates with the occipital condyles. Here you can see the axis. Um, it looks pretty similar to the cervical vertebra um, that's shown up on the top left. Um, but it does have that dens there, and that's really, uh, once you see that, you know you've got the C2 or the axis. All right, so now we're going to move to bones of the rib cage or the thoracic cage. So the thoracic cage forms the thorax uh, or chest portion of the body. It consists of 12 pairs of ribs, um, and they each have their own or share some coastal cartilage or costal cartilage, and there's also the sternum. Um, the ribs are anchored to the, th the 12 thoracic vertebrae. So there's 12 ribs and there are 12 thoracic vertebrae. And uh, it has a major function to protect the heart and lungs. So the sternum, which I've just highlighted, is the elongated bony structure. It anchors uh, the, the thoracic cage. And it consists of three parts. We've got the manubrium. Uh, the manubrium is a little bit wider uh, portion of the sternum. Uh, the top of the manubrium has this shallow U-shaped area called the um, jugular or suprasternal arch. And you can actually kind of feel this uh, if, you stick, um, if you stick your finger at the base of your neck. You also have the clavicular notch. This is a shallow depression located on either side of the manubrium. Uh, and this is where the clavicle will articulate. And you have costal notches, and this is where the costal cartilage is going to uh, interact with the manubrium. Now, the elongated central portion of the sternum is called the body. Uh, you can also see that there's costal notches here as well. The very inferior portion of uh, the sternum is the xiphoid process, and this small structure is uh, mostly cartilaginous early in life, but it will gradually become excuse me become ossified during middle age. Uh, and then we have the ribs. So let's talk about the ribs real quick. The ribs are numbered and divided into three categories based on how they attach to the sternum. So the fact that they're numbered is great. This makes it really easy because you guys don't have to remember a special name for each rib. They're just 1 through 12. But you do have to remember um, how they are anchored. Right. So uh, ribs 1 through 7... Uh, these are um, these are classified as true ribs, and that's because the costal cartilage from each of these ribs attaches directly and individually to the sternum. Okay, so that's these light blue ones. These are ribs one through seven. Ribs eight through twelve. These are called the false ribs, and this is because the costal cartilage from these ribs do not attach directly. So look at that white area. That's the costal cartilage. It doesn't uh, attach directly to the sternum. So for ribs 8 through 10, the cartilages are attached to the cartilage of the next higher rib. So rib 8, the cartilage is attached to rib 7. For rib 9, the cartilage is attached to rib 8. Okay, and you can kind of see that by looking at the white area in this photo. The last two ribs, these are called false ribs or floating ribs and that's because they don't attach to the sternum at all they just kind of wrap partially around and then stop okay and so those are the 12 ribs again you need to know the number uh, simply starting from the top um, and then you need to know if they're true false or floating um, and these are going to be uh, and, and you can tell that by looking at whether or not they attach or how their their cartilage interacts with the sternum sternum and that is it for the other axis bones. Thank you.